metabolic resuscitation in the mitochondria. Um, my disclosures are as follows, just mostly uh, research grants. Um, I did, uh, relevant, I have a number of branches from the NIH on, on thiamine, which I'll talk a little about, and also Conneca, which is an in, uh, investigator-initiated grants with uh, ubiquinol or turboenzyme Q10. So I wanted to start with a case um, of how I got interested in this area. This was a uh, dates back um, a number of years. It was a 59-year-old who presented a history of alcohol abuse and abdominal pain and vomiting. He was found on the street. He was confused, unable to provide his further history. Um, his vitals were as, as shown. He was tachypnic, dry mucous membranes, chest was cleared auscultation, and his, his belly just was mildly tender. And this is about 15 or so plus years ago. Um, and at this time, um, well, I should show the rest of his labs. He had a lactate of 27 um, and a pH of 6.9. Other than that, he was probably doing pretty all right. Um, but quite severe acidosis. And at this time, about 15, 20 years ago, um, the CT scan, was an emergency department. The CT scanners would take a long time you know, to get abdominal uh, CT imaging. So with such a high lactate and abdominal pain, um, the presumptive diagnosis of what was made, we ended up where? Bowel ischemia, and we ended up in the operating room. In fact, on the way up there, the senior resident was talking to me and explaining um, that this was just a surgical residence. This is classic bowel ischemia. We went to the operating room and continued to explain to the entire group and everybody how this is a classic presentation. Made the incision, opened the belly, and the, the uh, bowel was pristine and pink. At that point, I still remember the attending surgery uh, staff saying, uh, what were you saying about classic bowel ischemia? And at that moment, we closed the belly back up, went to the PACU. The anesthesiology crew was a little bit worried because we had just went to the uh, operating room with the wrong diagnosis and a lactate of 27. Um, got back to the operating room by the PACU and rechecked the lactate, and it was um, about 10. And then a couple hours later, the lactate it was even lower, and the patient was pointing to the endotracheal tube, wanted to get extubated. The patient was extubated within four hours, asking for a food tray within five hours, and was discharged home the following morning with nothing wrong with it. Now, it was a busy surgical service. I was really fascinated. What the heck just happened? I said to the chief surgical resident, I said, what do you think happened with this patient? He said, well, I don't know, he's better, move on, next case. <laughs> but I couldn't move on. I was fascinated what happened with this patient. He came in so early that he actually went to the operating room so quickly he didn't get antibiotics. He got 500 cc's of fluid, that's it. And then he got an exploratory laparotomy for the wrong diagnosis. And he got better in that time period. He got one other thing. A little bit of tricks that I know what I'm talking about. Does anyone know what else he got? He got a dose of thiamine, that's all he got. He got one dose of thiamine, and that's when I became fascinated with how on earth could this happen. Now he did me a favor. He came back, this is him here, LU, this is in 2002. He is in March, he came back in August with a lactate of 30 and a bicarb of 3, pH of 6.85. Now at this time, I had already looked into all of this. I was pretty confident that his first presentation was lactic acidosis secondary to thiamine deficiency. So at this time, instead of sending him to an operating room, we gave him an intravenous dose of thiamine. Within a few hours, he was basically getting better. And he, I don't even think he got admitted on that. He came back a third time in March of the following year. At this point, somebody saw him, said, hey, this is Mike Nino's buddy, lactate of 24, gave him a dose of thiamine, gave me a phone call. And he got better as well. And then we started seeing additional patients with that. So we kind of turned this gastrointestinal periperiod, all presented with abdominal pain. Now, was this really a new disease not previously described, or was this just good old-fashioned periperiod um, that we don't see as much anymore? I'm not sure. I did label it gastrointestinal periperiod because I wanted emergency physicians to kind of be aware that this can present with an abdominal pain syndrome and, and severe lactic acidosis. Now, the other thing that's fascinating with this case is that the patient, um, on two occasions, had central lines in. Because um, when they presented it so sick, no one knew what was going on, put it in a central line. And the central venous saturation was 97%, 96% in that area. Basically, there was no extraction of oxygen. They were facultative anaerobes. And what's going on here? See, 
if you look at the glycolysis pyruvate getting into the Krebs cycle, it goes by this step here. Um, and if it can't get through this step, it, it, pyruvate will get converted to lactic acidosis. Um, the key enzyme here is pyruvate dehydrogenase, and thiamine is that key cofactor for pyruvate dehydrogenase. So if you don't have thiamine, you can't get into your Krebs cycle, you can basically become a facetative anaerobe, as these folks were becoming. Now, it's interesting when you look at the history of Berry Berry, it's a fascinating history. It actually, before they figured out it was related to vitamin deficiencies, and it may not just be thiamine, by the way, um, they thought it was an infectious disease. And think about that. It was first thought that, that Berry Berry was an infectious disease, and the reason was is because most of these patients presented with fever and infectious <laughs> symptoms. And we're going to come back to that. But they also often had, it, when they would die, lactic acidosis, hypertension, shock. Sound familiar? Sounds just like septic shock. And why were they presenting with fever? And I'll come back to that in a couple slides. Now, I do want to step back one moment because this is a talk about just generalized mitochondrial resuscitation. I'm talking a little bit about, mostly about thiamine because that's kind of what I, what I know most and where we have probably more data. But I just want to mention is that there are other simple components just like thiamine all throughout, and as mentioned by one of our previous speakers, um, all throughout different uh, cycles of the mitochondria, whether it be riboflavin, niacin, lead lipoic acid, which is another cofactor for pyruvate dehydrogenase, uh, carnitine, uh, or coenzyme Q10, uh, further down into the, in, into the electron transport chain. So there's all sorts of potential metabolic components of this chain that what I'm concerned about is they could potentially, in critical illness, become depleted. So the, we actually looked at thiamine and pyruvate dehydrogenase, the key enzyme um, that it works upon, activity during the metabolic stress of critical illness. We use a cabbage uh, patients. Patients come in for, for coronary artery bypass. It's really a great population to look at because they come in, they shake your hand, they're not really all that sick. You take a blood, well, relatively, they have a, you know, a focused heart problem, but they come in uh, electively, the ones we looked at. We shake their hand, check their blood sample, then they get a major stressor and then we take another blood sample. So we'd be able to see what was going on. And we could see that thiamine levels were depleted. We also measured pyruvate dehydro dehydrogenase, similar to some of the previous speakers, we used mononuclear cells. And we would see that pyruvate dehydrogenase levels were decreased post-surgery, thiamine levels were decreased. Um, but this isn't the only thing that gets decreased in critical illness. We also have seen coenzyme Q10, we've measured in septic patients, uh, and then we see that coenzyme Q10 levels are dep depressed. Um, in cardiac arrest patients, coenzyme Q10 levels are, are depressed. So in critical illness and increased metabolism, um, there can be a depletion of some of these enzymes, and so uh, some of these uh, metabolic components. So I come back to that slide I showed you on Berry Berry, and, when, and I said at the time I'd come back to that. Why is it important that Berry Berry was originally thought to be an infectious disease? In my opinion, is what was going on in those patients who presented with Berry Berry is they had percolating nutritional subclinical deficiencies, and then they got infected, and they churned the rest of their metabolism, and they then developed an, an over Berry Berry. So the infection may bring out some of these deficiencies, and it may be a component of our, of our infection. If you look at one of the largest case series of Wernicke's encephalopathy out there. 50-60% of those patients actually presented with infection. And I believe it's because they were using their metabolic storage. Yeah, some of the previous speakers spoke about looking at cellular oxygen consumption. We did the same. We looked at cellular oxygen consumption in mononuclear cells. Um, uh, someone mentioned they had a, a, a lab and a bicycle. We didn't really bike in. It's not as safe in Boston. But nonetheless, we, we did have people come into the lab at all hours and measure oxygen consumption. And oxygen consumption is lower in sepsis. This is in, if the red is, is just um, a control patient, uh, or there's just um, a patient where we didn't put anything else into their blood. So this is a control patient in red here, and here's a septic patient, and you can see oxygen consumption is on this uh, y-axis. Oxygen consumption is lower in sepsis. Um, the consumption when at maximal respiration is also lower in sepsis. And what's represented in this blue here just happens to be thiamine, uh, but we've used other um, metabolic components. We've put coenzyme Q10 in as well, and we can actually restore oxygen consumption by putting thiamine in here in vitro, or um, uh, coenzyme Q10 interestingly does the same. So oxygen consumption is depressed early in sepsis and then restored um, by these metabolic factors. 
The other thing is, is that if this is all true, we, I, one of my fellows said to me, hey, you know, Mike, if this is true, then what about things like magnesium? That's in the correct cycle. That's, that's, it's, magnesium should be at play too. And it was interesting, I did see a patient who had profound hypomagnesemia who had a lactic acidosis, and, and they got better after we repleted their magnesium. It was, a, it was also an alcoholic, so it was kind of hard to know. It, so I, you know, I said, well, you know what, let's take a look and see. Let's look at use some big data and see if there's an association um, between magnesium concentrations and lactic acidosis. And again, this is a, you know, observational data, big data, but in hypothesis generating. But we did find that, the, the, that magnesium levels were associated with lactic acidosis. Low magnesium levels, higher lactate levels. Again, consistent with the, with the concept that, um, uh, that some of these elements are key for a good flux through the mitochondria. So we started to decide, we decided to start throwing some of these things at patients who were septic and whatnot. One of the things we did try, try was ubiquinol. Again, it's a reduced form of coenzyme Q10. It's, it's a little bit better bioavailability. We did a pilot randomized trial with patients um, to see if we could get it absorbed in their, absorbed in their system and looked at various uh, functions in mitochondria. Um, again, the interest time not to go through the whole study. But we, unfortunately, we didn't really. We, we were able to find that we could get ubiquinol into patients, and it was absorbed. But we didn't really have an impact on markers of inflammation or mitochondrial injury, um, and we did not see any difference in clinical parameters. There was potentially a number. This is a very small study, just 40 patients, um, uh, and, and, and we did get it to the later disease. Um, but nonetheless, we didn't really see much with ubiquinol. I know others have thrown different things out there. I could put up any number of slides. There's a recent one on, on carnitine by Jones et al. And again, it didn't really show um, much difference. One that, and I'll just um, close with one of the uh, uh, other pilot trials that we had done with uh, thiamine. And so, uh, again, I have a separate lecture later on thiamine. It talks a little bit more about our prelim data that led up to this and some of the other components. But in short, we did a, a prospective double-blind trial with thiamine 200 milligrams versus placebo for seven days um, at two centers. And what we found was we had 88 patients overall, approximately uh, 44 in each group. And this is lactate in, in placebo is in red, and, and th the group that received thiamine is in blue. And while median levels were kind of similar over time, you can see the red or the, the placebo, that you could, they have mul many um, subjects who had high persistent lactic acidosis in, in, the, in the high range, in the uh, 90th percentile and whatnot, whereas it's much tighter um, in, the, um, in those who received thiamine. So the medians weren't different, but if you looked at the difference over time, it was statistically lower overall in the group that received thiamine. Now these are patients overall. Unfortunately, we didn't see, I was a little disappointed not to see a survival difference between the groups overall. But we had gone in with a pre-planned uh, pre analysis of looking at patients who were thiamine deficient. So we had measured thiamine levels in all of these patients. And 35%, now again, it's important the inclusion criteria I should tell you. These are septic shock patients who had a lactate greater than 3. So these are sick patients who had persistent lactic acidosis. 35% of them had thiamine deficiency, which we'll talk about in a moment. The other thing, and I, oh, I should mention this, for the pop, before I get to what that, that 35%, for the population overall, we also, this was kind of, I got in hindsight, I was actually listening to a, a, a lecture about talking about um, uh, how mitochondria rich the kidneys are. And it occurred to me that thiamine could have a renal protective factor. We hadn't done this a priori, so we post hoc did, analysis, did analysis of that and found that those patients who received thiamine went on to receive renal replacement therapy 3% of the time, whereas the control group 23% of the time. And that was statistically significant. So there was a reduction in renal injury for the group overall. And then for the deficient population, I said before that there was these subtle differences in lactic acidosis for the group overall. When we're looking at this deficient group of 28 patients, nothing was subtle. There was a marked decrease in, in lactic level, lactic acid levels, median, mean, range, everything, in patients who received thiamine as compared to placebo. And this is where we started picking up there was some activity here. And that was then consistent with what we found with the survival, and there was a Drop, uh, early drop-off in survival, the placebo patients died early, 
and then the, you can see the difference in mortality here. The Kaplan-Meier curve is statistically significant because we had a lot of patients die early in the placebo group. And then the absolute mortality difference was 46 to 13 percent. And given the sample size was relatively small, um, that was non-significant, but you can see the trends moving in the right direction. Um, in conclusion, I would say that mitochondrial resuscitation holds promise in critical illness, but patient selection and targeting is essential. A number of nutritional-based or simple mitochondrial cofactors could be considered. And thiamine is a key cofactor for mitochondrial function, can be depleted during critical illness, and may serve as a mitochondrial resuscitated in selected populations. I think it's key here that I don't think this is a cure-all. I think it's in selected populations at highest risk for manifesting deficiency. I also, before I want to conclude, I think it's fine. We just heard the previous lecture on uh, metformin. I think this is an interesting concept because if you look at it, it's actually contrary to a little bit of what I'm saying here. We're talking about trying to improve flux through the mitochondria, trying to increase pyruvate dehydrogenase, and metformin is actually doing the opposite. Um, so I'm interested to hear what people would say on that, but I will say that in our lab, we did look at what metformin um, effect on pervert dehydrogenase, and it appears to, at high doses, it inhibits that as well. So my concern with that is that when you're talking about the people who are on metformin pre, uh, before they come in for weeks, uh, are their cells just adapting to a lower met metabolic state, and then when they're in the stress of being switched to anaerobic metabolism, they're better able to adapt? Because if that's the case, then acute delivery of metformin could potentially be harmful. So I think these things are all in play. I actually don't know what the answer is. I think it's, that was a great lecture and provocative. But just to point out there that there's a difference in approach and maybe even different patients would need different things. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you.